I'm going to be reading in the Old Testament. If you want to turn there, while you're turning, it's going to be Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13. While you're turning there, I want to remind you that uh, in our bulletins, we've been inserting a bulletin insert. And it's uh, always a good lesson, uh, so it's in addition to, to uh, what we hear in the sermon. And uh, thanks, David, for your reading. For all things work together for the good of those who love Christ Jesus. And this bulletin insert talks about what loving Jesus looks like. Okay, Proverbs chapter 13. I'll be reading 1 through 13. A wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. From the fruit of a man's mouth he enjoys good, but the desire of the treacherous is violence. The one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts disgustingly and shamefully. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. There is one who pretends to be rich, but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, but has great wealth. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but the poor hears no rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked goes out. Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles but the one who gathers by labor increases it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. The one who despises the word will be in debt to it, but the one who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for uh, setting this time that we can gather and worship you, and I pray that everything that we do would would please you, especially as we read and study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Trust in 
surpassing all the rest. It's an ocean full of blessing in the midst of every test. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, mighty Savior, precious friend. Turn with me to Colossians, if you'd like to read along. I'll be reading in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so 
also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen. Amen. My faith is found in resting place, number 412. found a resting place not in device nor creed I trust the ever living one his word for me shall plead I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died
standing to believe what God said. The reading for this morning will be from chapter 2 of Philippians. Chapter 2 of Philippians, and we'll be reading verses 12 through 18. 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's pray together. Father, once again, as we come into your presence, as we sing, sing hymns of praise to you, as we pray as we gather for fellowship. We do all for your glory, Lord. You alone are worthy of our worship, and we praise you. You are our Redeemer, our Savior, our King, Priest. And we ask now as we open up your word, Lord, that you would teach us. Lord, as we uh, come to you, we admit that we... Uh, have finite minds, and sometimes we don't understand fully. But Lord, with your help, the help of the Holy Spirit, we just we ask that you give us teaching and understanding. And Lord, more than that, we ask that you change our hearts to be conformed to your image. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue, can you, we are continue on with our study of the book of Philippians, uh, you may recall we are in the midst of uh, a tremendous pastoral call to sanctification from the Apostle Paul. I think it would be beneficial to remind you of this textual sandwich that we discussed last week. Remember, we began the section in a, uh, with a missionary report from Paul that resulted in persecution that resulted in imprisonment, uh, but also resulted in what? In the advancement of the gospel to places that had never been before, and also to a, an increased boldness in the preaching of the gospel, uh, all of which produced joy in both Paul and the Philippians. And we also know that in chapter 2, verse 19, Paul starts back up the missionary report, uh, so sandwiched in between those two missionary reports is this extensive and detailed report, a detailed call to sanctification. Now, do you remember why? Why Paul is now breaking this sandwich up, why he's breaking off from the initial missionary report to issue this call to sanctification? Well, it's because it's just human nature that when an authority figure tells us, in essence, everything's going to be all right, yeah, these are trying times, but we're going to get through this, everything's all right, God has got this, right? God is in control, He's going to handle it. Our, our uh, fallen human nature tends to say, well, okay, God's got this, I can just sit back and marvel at what he's going to do or what he's done. And so we tend to let our guards down. 
So Paul stops in the middle of this report and raises his finger in warning and says, don't do that. Don't let down your guard. Uh, live as good citizens, right? We went through that. Live as good citizens of the kingdom of God. Have a proper understanding of eternity. Know that it's God's plans that are important and not our plans and that we are to be committed to God's plans and let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Strive for unity in the body, unity in the gospel. Don't walk in fear of the opponents of the gospel but understand that if you are living a life worthy of the gospel, you are going to suffer as Christ suffered. And we are, all, we are to do all of this with the attitude of humility, looking to Christ as our example, uh, as the ultimate example of humility, who humbled himself and was obedient even unto death, even death on a cross. All of that explains Paul's call to sanctification here. Good citizenship, humility, and now the final section is a call to Christian obedience. And just like last week, we need to keep our focus here tightly on the context. Why? Because we have ourselves here yet another bear trap, if you will, another verse that has been twisted, that has been ripped from its context uh, and used as proof text um, for either a works-based salvation or that you can lose your salvation, both of which are a false teaching, uh, both of which are false views of salvation. We know from Paul's other writings and from the rest of the whole New Testament that salvation is by grace and grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we can do to earn our, or deserve our salvation. And furthermore, when Christ saves us, and hallelujah for this, when Christ saves us, when the God of the universe uh, sets His affections upon us, we are utterly safe in His hands. For nothing... Nothing can snatch us out of his hands. And yet, when we read Paul's imperative, and it is in the imperative, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, it does give one a little pause, maybe a little head scratch. What does that mean? What is he talking about here? If it doesn't mean we have to work to earn our salvation or work to keep our salvation... What could it possibly mean? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. What does that mean? What indeed does that loaded phrase mean? Now, the outline for today's message is as follows. It's up there on the board, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you uh, because we're going to get pretty late into the morning, and you're going to say, wait a minute, he's only on point one. We're only going to get through point one this morning. So don't worry, we'll have you out. You'll be able to get to Mr. Gaddy's before the Methodist. <laughs> so here's the outline. Work out your own salvation, verses 12 through 13. Uh, do so without grumbling or disputing. Hold fast to the word of life and do so for the joy set before you. We'll get to those last three next Sunday, Lord willing. So this is a call to obedience to the believer. It's a call to obedience to the believer within the larger context of a call to sanctification. And we're going to talk about it. Work out your own salvation. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So we're just going to walk through this passage step by step and see what we see. First, therefore. That's what we see first, right? Therefore. The word therefore, we all know what that means by now. I hope you do. It means 
Look back in the previous verses and see what that therefore is there for. What is he talking about? Because of what? What have, what have we discussed in the previous verses? We've talked about the humiliation of Christ himself. He's voluntarily taking on the form of man, that schema, the form of man, the form of a servant being born in the likeness of a man, humbling himself by being becoming obedient, make note of that word, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So with that word, therefore, Paul is pointing us back to the example of Jesus Christ, the humiliation and the obedience of Jesus Christ, specifically uh, His death on the cross, His obedience to the sovereign will of God the Father. He's saying, child of God. And Paul uses the word beloved there. Beloved. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. Walk in obedience to the will of the Father, to the commands of Christ. It's in the imperative. It's a command. So, okay, that's step one. Next step. Paul speaks to the quality of the obedience. The quality of the obedience. This is obedience that has legs. Right? This is obedience that has consistency. This is obedience that has integrity. Focus on that word, integrity. This is a, by the way, a slam in the face of those who are preaching the, from the gospel uh, of selfish ambition, those that he's talked about previously, those who are preaching with wrong motives. He's saying they, the hypocrites, may look like they're obeying, right? They may indeed practice a form of obedience when everyone is looking, when everyone is watching. We would say this in this culture they do a lot of virtue signaling, conspicuous consumption, they do a lot of that, but it is, is it genuine obedience? No, it is not. Why? Because it's hypocrisy. Paul commends the Philippians for being obedient, not just in his presence, right? Not just when he's around, not just when he's looking, but they also obey much more in his absence. So this is an obedience that, again, has legs. It has consistency. It has integrity. That is a high quality of obedience. All right? So step one, we follow the example of Christ in obedience. Step two, it's a high quality obedience. So it's obedience even when no one is looking. And now we come to the big phrase. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we know that it doesn't mean we are saved by works, right? Shake your head if you know it doesn't mean that. That would be a direct contradiction to Scripture elsewhere. That would be a direct contradiction to Ephesians 2, for example. That would be a, a direct contradiction to the entire book of Romans. Uh, basically, the whole New Testament. We, we uh, uh, can easily observe and verify a gospel of grace throughout the whole New Testament. We can also know that it doesn't mean you can lose your salvation. right? That would be a contradiction. That would be a contradiction to the verse that David uh, read this morning. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Uh, the, the order of salvation is what that's known, uh, known as. Uh, John 10, 28 and 29, among other places... So we know it doesn't mean that we can lose our salvation. So what does it mean? That takes us to step three. Look at the word itself, work out. Work out. It is in the imperative mood, so it is a command. It is in the present tense, so it indicates continuing action, continuing emphasis. It's also in the middle voice, which means the the person receiving the command, that's us, carries out the responsibility to do what is commanded. You yourselves work it out. So Paul is saying to the Philippians, 
you must act, you must obey, you must follow the example of Christ's obedience and actively fight sin. You must do it. The New Testament is full of this truth. I'm not just picking it out and emphasizing it here. It's all through the New Testament. Let me give you one example, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness and completion in the fear of God. Or how about Colossians 3, 2 through 3. Set your minds on things that are above not things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 1 Corinthians 9.24 Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. 1 Corinthians 9.25 Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I I myself should be disqualified. 1 Timothy 6.11 But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and, uh, and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I could go on and on and on. But the point is made, and the point is this, it is clear, it is crystal clear from the biblical testimony, which is our only source of truth, amen, Amen. that the Christian life, following the example of Christ's humility and His obedience, is not to be one of passivity. There seems to be this misconception prevalent in today's Christian culture that, you know what, God's got this. We just need to let go and let God, and He'll handle it. That kind of frees us up to do what? To do nothing. When it's clear from this command, beloved, walk in obedience all the more when no one is looking. Work it out. You have a personal responsibility to obey. You have a personal responsibility to demonstrate in tangible ways that your salvation is genuine. And that's really what this is talking about. It helps me to change the word order a little bit and said, this is the outworking of your salvation. If you have been redeemed by Christ... You will, not if, you will follow His example in humility and obedience. You will show it. It it will work itself out in your life. Okay? Got it? Step four. Paul commands us to work out our salvation, how? With fear and trembling. With fear and trembling. So step four gives us the motive here, the motive for walking in obedience. I'm going to make a statement, and it may in fact shock some of you, so hold on to your seats. Here it is. You ready? God hates sin. Right? God hates sin. Some of you may be saying, Jamie, you're sorely mistaken. We serve a God of love and mercy and grace, and He has a wonderful plan for our lives. He accepts us just as we are. Who are we to judge? I heard a well-known pastor say the other day, we shouldn't be telling lost people that God has a wonderful plan for their lives because unless they repent and get saved, God's plan for them is not wonderful. In fact, it's literally hell. God hates sin. There are always consequences for sin. You say, wait a minute, Christ died for my sin, therefore the consequences have been removed. How many of you really believe that? 
I, I think we can say eternally, without question, eternally speaking, yes, the consequences of sin are taken care of, but there's still consequences for sin in the here and now. And being a professing Christian does not shield you from the consequences of sin in the here and now. And therefore, we should have this attitude. We should walk in obedience because we have a healthy sense of fear of what could happen if we don't. Paul's not saying you could lose your salvation. He, you could certainly, though, lose your joy. Right? That's the... That's the theme of Galatians. We're talking about joy. That's the overall thesis. You could lose your joy as a believer if you get caught up in a sin pattern in your life. You could definitely lose your joy. You could definitely use your te- lose your testimony as a believer. You could definitely bring shame upon the name of Christ because of our actions. We should have a healthy sense of fear of all that. We should walk in fear and trembling of what happens if we don't fight sin in our lives. Listen, Christian, you can never, ever think, listen to me carefully, you can never, ever think that at some point in your Christian life you are mature enough to handle any temptation to sin. Right? If you ever get there, you're in trouble. Satan goes to and fro and he's seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking to destroy your joy. He's seeking to destroy your testimony. He cannot take your salvation, but he can still do a lot of damage. So work it out. Walk in obedience with fear and trembling. Last step. And here we really circles back to the command to be humble, really. It's the human nature, it's our human nature to become proud with accomplishments and progress. So let's say you follow the command to obedience. You are working out your salvation with fear and trembling. And you start looking around. And you notice, wow, I'm really good at this. Look at that guy over there. I'm way more obedient than him. Just look at all the stuff that he does. And he calls himself a Christian. I'm so morally superior. Pretty much anybody else. Folks, that's pride. Right? That's pride. I've known people that even take their pride, uh, take pride in their level of humility. I've heard people actually say, humility is something that I'm very good at. Verse 13 has been called the sword for putting an end to all pride. For it is God who works in you. For it is God who works in you. Amen. So wait a minute, Pastor. You've just said that We can't be passive. We have to work it out ourselves. We have to take personal responsibility to fight sin. We cannot just sit back and let things happen, passively say, God, you've got this. Take care of it. But now you're saying it's God who works in you. Which is it? Which is it? Is it both? Does God do His thing and then we do our thing and the result is obedience? That's not what this passage says. That's not exactly what Paul is saying here. I think the whole of the matter is cleared up with the next phrase. It says, which says, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So think of it this way. Any action that we take requires two elements. We must have first the inclination or desire to do the action. Paul calls that the will. And secondly, we must have the energy or the ability to carry out the action. Paul calls that the work. Who does the will and the work? What Paul is really saying is 
is that when it comes to walking in obedience, to working out your salvation with fear and trembling, it is God and God alone who gives you the inclination to walk in obedience and then gives you the energy to do it. Let me read you a quote from John Murray. All working out of our salvation on our part is the effect of God's working in us. We have here not only the explanation of all acceptable activity on our part, but also have the incentive to our willing and working. The more persistently active we are in working, the more persuaded we may be that all the energizing grace and, God, grace and power is of God. That single understanding removes any foundation for the building up of any pride in ourselves. And that single understanding results in no glory for us, but all the glory for God. It is indeed the sword that kills all pride. One final point, and we'll call it the sixth step to understanding this verse. And it is the final phrase, for His good pleasure. For it is God who gives us the inclination, He gives us the energy... And it does this all for his good pleasure. This is an amazing verse. Don't skip over that, that passage. Don't skip over those, those little words there. Uh, I think it, the temptation is it's just kind of a tagline at the end of an important verse. But it cannot be glossed over because it is a vital spiritual truth here. The word there for pleasure means uh, great enjoyment and satisfaction. Another word for that could be joy. Joy. Think about that. Our obedience brings God joy. Our obedience brings God joy. Yes, I know. I just said that God gives us both the inclination and the energy to obey. But there it is right here in black and white. When we fight sin, when we respond to God's enabling power with proper genuine obedience and the outworking of our salvation is apparent, if the outworking of our salvation is apparent and authentic, guess what it does? It brings the God of this universe satisfaction and joy. Can you get on board with that? There's something more. It's a little bit deeper. That same word translated as pleasure also carries with it the idea of favor, or will, or deliberate design, or purpose. That makes me mindful of another verse with the same focus, Romans 129. I'm sorry, 829. Interesting that you read that verse. God is in control, isn't he? This is, again, the order of salvation, the ordo salutis, as in those he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. That's the order. Now here's the point I want to stress. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. I know, predestined is this big theological word that simply means to decide beforehand or to ordain. It is God's good pleasure or purpose or will which He decided to do from before the foundations of the world. He decided to save us to, and then to conform us, sanctify us to the image of His Son. Why? We're told why right here. In order that He, that's the Son, in order that the Son might be the firstborn among many brothers. That phrase, firstborn among many brothers, is an idiom, idiom denoting a place of great honor. Firstborn sons had all the honor. So when we are sanctified, when we are conformed to the image of Christ, when we walk in obedience in order to glorify the Son, we bring honor to God. We bring honor to God. Our sanctification is and was God's plan from the very beginning. And when His plans are accomplished, 
It brings him great satisfaction and great joy. Now, what happens when we don't walk in obedience? If our walking in obedience brings great joy, what happens when we don't? It breaks God's heart. Breaks God's heart. So, child of God, you have been called by God to work out your own salvation, to work it out, let it show. That's, that's not a call to work or earn your salvation. It is a call, listen to me very carefully, it is a call to show evidence of your salvation by behaving like a child of God. To walk like a child of God even when no one is looking. And when you do, you bring ultimate glory to God the Father and glory to God the Son and glory to God the Holy Spirit. Now, you can see by the time that we're not going again to get to the rest of the points. I've already mentioned that. But we have a little time left over, and I purposely planned that uh, because uh, in this moment we have a dear sister in the body who's having a health crisis, uh, CJ, and she's up in Burleson. And there, she's struggling, um, and so I thought we would spend the next few minutes together praying for CJ and Paul, okay? Um, I'm going to have the elders, if you would, come forward. And let's just stand together. Let's all stand together. I'm, I'm going to lead us, and uh, if any of you feel led to pray out loud for CJ as I pray, and then I'll finish, okay? Father God, we come to you now. We thank you for your word that is so clear. We are to honor you in obedience. Bring glory to you, bring joy to you, bring pleasure to you, Lord, satisfaction to you as we walk in obedience and do what you have predestined us to do, be conformed to the image of your Son. I pray that we would do that now. And as we come now, Lord, we're troubled. We're struggling because of our sister and her health crisis. Lord, I want to pray for CJ right now, Lord, that you would work it out. You would work out all the issues that she's facing, that they would be able to do what they need to do to get her better. Lord, be with Paul. Give him courage and strength to advocate for her and to be on her side up there and to make sure everything is done right, done well. And Lord, I pray that you would be with the doctors. Give them wisdom. Uh, give them uh, the ability to heal, Lord. Thank you for the nurses that are being so kind to her. And Lord, I ask that you just uh, take control of that whole situation, Lord, so that she can get well and get back to uh, this body and this town. Father God, once again, you are in control. You are the great healer. You are the great physician. She's in your hands, Lord. And we ask that you take care of her for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Josh.